But first today, all eyes on the economic survey, which gives the government's blueprint for the economy ahead of budget 2022. The key takeaways, according to the economic survey, the Indian economy is now at the pre-pandemic level. An 8 to 8.5% growth forecast in 22-23, 9.2% growth in 21-22, 11.8% industrial sector growth in financial year 22, 8.2% service sector growth still to reach pre-COVID level here, pre-private consumption yet to hit pre-COVID level. But by and large, what is being suggested is the worst is over after two years of the pandemic. Ahead of the union budget, the government tabled the economic survey in parliament. The survey has projected, as I said, an 8 to 8.5 percent growth forecast in 22 23. It says that the Indian economy is not yet at pre pandemic level, with private consumption in particular not hitting the levels it was before the pandemic occurred in March 2020. Just what does this economic survey mean? We'll have a discussion on that in a moment, but first, Take a look at our top story. The economic survey 2021-22 tabled in Parliament on Monday gives many reasons to cheer and few to worry. The good news first. The Indian economy is back at pre-pandemic level. The growth of 2021-22 is pegged at 9.2%, coming after the minus 7.3 seen the previous year and 4% in 2019 to 2020. The survey says the GDP is now 1.3%, more than what it was before COVID. The 67% jump in revenues during April to November, compared with the same period last year, means the government has elbow room to manage its finances. We expect that there will be a fairly robust growth into the next year, and we forecast that India's GDP will grow in real terms by 8 to 8.5% in 22-23. The economy is in a good place to grow strongly into the next year or two. And all the macro uh, stability indicators suggest that you know, there is a fair amount of buffer. Now the big concern. The survey has red flagged the rising global inflation. The global oil prices have crossed $90 per barrel. Consumer inflation in the U.S. has reached 7%, the highest since 1982. While the retail inflation in India is within the RBI target of 5.6%, global prices could affect us too. WPI has popped back up and is in double digits. Now, some of that, of course, is a reflection of um, uh, uh, the low base from last year. So that will, of course, wear, wear itself out. Uh, but we do need to be concerned here in India uh, about the fact that there is significant imported inflation, particularly from energy prices, that will be something we need to watch out for. Experts expect government to continue its support measures in this budget too. The three most important issues are demand generation, unemployment and inflation. If they focus on these three in the coming year, I think they're going to be a lot better off. However, the 300 million middle class which has been left alone, needs attention in this year. They are the true demand generations, generators. The survey has highlighted the role of vaccination in recovery. It says a rapid pace of vaccination will lead to faster normalization of economic activity. The survey has also defended the government's policy of supply-side support, saying measures to increase demand on its own won't help given the unpredictability of the pandemic. Bureau Report, India Today. So is the economy out of the woods? Is the worst over for the Indian economy as we look ahead to budget 2022? But is the recovery uneven on the other hand? Are we not seeing a V-shaped recovery, but as they now say, a W-shaped recovery? What are the biggest concerns as we look at the budget tomorrow? How do you fight rising inequality? Is that really the critical question? Is India better placed to tackle any disruption today than we were two years ago? Just some of the questions that we are going to raise tonight. But the primary question is simply that. Is the worst over? Are we really on the road to recovery? Joining me 
now is Dr. Pranab Sen, former Chief Statistician for our Program Director at IGC, someone who's been a critic of the government. We'll also be joined in a moment by Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, will join us. Madan Sabnavis is Chief Economist at Bank of Baroda. Uh, Shankar Ayer uh, is a writer, author, journalist, and uh, someone who tracks the economy closely. S.C. Garg, former Finance Secretary, is with us. Professor Arun Kumar, uh, who has from JNU and has been again a critic of the government, but we've got therefore those who have been supportive of the government's measures as well as critics joining us and Dr. Rajiv Kumar joins us in a short while. Pranab Sen, let me come to you, former chief statistician of the government. Your sense from the econ economic survey as you saw it today, uh, is the survey giving you a sense that the economy is in good health? Uh, that we are back to pre-pandemic levels? Or is the government, in a sense, uh, hiding some of the worst aspects of what has gone wrong? Uh, do you believe that there is still a concern because growth in particular appears uneven across sectors? Well, you know, what they have done in the economic survey is faithfully reproduce what the National Statistics Office brought out in their... Uh, uh, estimates of the of the national accounts for the current year so these are the first advanced estimates now uh, one would have expected a little bit more from uh, from the economic survey than than just that because the statisticians are being true to their nature but the economic survey i think has to be a lot more nuanced mm -hmm. now, unfortunately i don't think much of that has happened so there has been recognition for instance of weak consumption but there doesn't seem to be any analysis of why the consumption is weak and what it really means for the future of the economy. So according to you, the big concern that emerges out of this economic survey, because you've been critical in the recent times, particularly with the lack of attention, as you've been saying, that is being paid according to you to the informal sector, the fact that micro and small and uh, medium in enterprises continue to hurt. What is that big red flag that you find in this survey that should worry us? Well, the big red flag, Rajdeep, <clears throat> is that that doesn't seem to have been recognized as the single largest problem that we face today. Uh, so if you look at the, the, uh, the issues that they have expressed concern about, uh, inflation, uh, what is going to happen in the global economy, particularly as the U.S., starts rolling back the fiscal stimulus, I'm sorry, the monetary stimulus. So all of these are, are flagged, and they're important issues, mind you. But the big issue mm -hmm. in the Indian context is the weakness in the informal and the small and uh, micro and small enterprises. That does not seem to have mm -hmm. been flagged. And unless an issue is flagged, it's not going to be addressed. Right. Uh, S.C. Garg? Your, your big takeaway from this economic survey, you've been someone who's tracked this government. What's the big positive that you're seeing? See, first thing, the positive is that we are, we are back to the normal, we are at the pre-COVID level. So that's one comfort in my judgment. But let's remember that even before the, the COVID struck us, Mm -hmm. In 1920, we grew only at sub 4% level. Mm -hmm. So in three years put together of the government, we have now grown average at 2% per annum. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very low growth. Now, the second thing, which is a positive thing, the confidence that the government has said that it can grow 8 to 8.5% next year, but the confidence is based on what factors uh, that analysis is, is, is missing. It's only some caveats that if these things don't happen, we will grow. But is there a reform agenda for putting the economy back? Is there a demand um, uh, agenda? Is there a way how do we control the inflation? So those things are missing. The survey is more like a report of the status than a strategy or a policy choice of how we can put India 
back on a sustainable high growth path. I let think me, that's missing and that's let, a big risk. Let me take what you've just said to Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Vice Chairman uh, Niti Ayog joins me at this moment. Appreciate your joining us, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Uh, a lot of attention is being focused on the big number that we are back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the latest economic survey uh, had projected the uh, economic growth at 8 to 8.5 percent, but often these targets are missed. You might remember that the last economic survey projected economic growth for 2021-22 at 11 percent. Now the estimated growth is 9.2 percent. The economy contracted by 7.3% during 2021 as against the projection of 6 to 6.5% in the economic survey. So when today the economic survey projects GDP at 8 to 8.5%, are you optimistic that we will meet this target? It is great to be here, but uh, let me start off by pointing out that the IMF uh, has um, projected India's growth rate in FY23 at 9%. Mm -hmm. And earlier in a program, actually on India Today, I was told that these growth estimates are conservative. And other, uh, other multilateral agencies are also talking about the same level. Now, you know, uh, I heard Subhash saying as to what these were based on, and the survey actually lays down that. He's, it lays down that there are several factors which have improved. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the financial sector, now the banks are much better capitalized. Their capital, rate, capital adequacy ratio is much higher. Their NPAs and, uh, you know, both gross and net are much lower. So they're ready to, uh, they're ready to lend. Uh, credit to non-food non uh, sectors has risen finally, as rising now and uh, having hit a bottom a, a couple of years ago. Uh, the consumption demand is hopefully going to improve with the uh, with the showing of agriculture, and and therefore there are some uh, the, you know there is some talk about uh, you know improvement in rural demand as well for that, uh, and you know and and most importantly the government has shown its commitment uh, to uh, public to ramping up public uh, capital expenditure, 15% growth last year, and uh, you know and and a, and a commitment to do same. Because, and this is what the economic survey talks about, that uh, growth of infrastructure mm -hmm. through public capex will help both the demand and the supply side by removing the supply side bottlenecks. So, you know, then finally the exports. You know, you know that there are more than 300 billion uh, to, uh, April to December. Uh, the global economy looks quite good still. And therefore, you know, that tide is still... Are fairly high, so our exports can continue to do better. Mm -hmm. These are, I think, sufficient factors to base your estimates of 8.5% growth rate, uh, especially when others expect us to grow even higher at a, at a faster rate. You know, the, the reason I'm, uh, I, as I said, in, in recent years, you, the government has missed the targets. There was the pandemic that sort of shook the economy in a way. The economic survey, Dr. Kumar, presents the rosy picture, exports doing well, for example, the fiscal situation is good, but the deep concerns, underlying concerns about unemployment, 84% of households have lost their incomes or, or there's been a decline in incomes in the last two years. We still don't know how that's going to be addressed and the big key question of how private investment and consumption in particular is going to revive to the levels of pre-pandemic uh, India. Is yeah. the, as I said, is the survey presenting a slightly rosy picture in what is actually very difficult times, Dr. Kumar? Well, the times are difficult and the times are faced with, uh, laced and faced with uncertainty, which the economic survey points out that, you know, we are living in times, you know, faced with uh, significant uncertainty. And it also talks about, there is a clear statement in the first chapter itself about the consumption weakness. Uh, that there remains a consumption weakness which has to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Now, the consumption weak, one part of the government that, and it, you know, uh, that the government has done already mm -hmm. is to take care of that by transferring, I think it's 1.8 lakh crore under, Pisan, under uh, Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi uh, to the 11 crore, you know, farming households. That's one part of it. So that's direct transfer. On the other hand, uh, it's also committed to ramping up 
uh, as I said earlier, the uh, capital expenditure and build up the infrastructure and the housing sector, mm -hmm. which will generate sustainable employment. Now, the other part could have been, and, and people can argue that the services sector, which were the hardest hit, uh, could be, you know, could, uh, could, could be given some direct transfer, some direct support, because that's also where uh, the most, uh, the largest number of informal uh, sector workers are, and, and they, have, they have, of course, uh, you know, suffered during the pandemic. And maybe, you, you, you know, we don't know. Let's see what the budget holds tomorrow. By the way, it's not economic survey's job to lay down policies. It's the budget's job. And the economic survey lays the background for that mm -hmm. by providing us all the analytics and, 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 the, and the trends and, and, and the background for that. And this, I think, uh, all, all the people on your panel mm -hmm. that I see are so well versed in this that they would know this, that the, back, that the economic survey is, 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 is a document of record and is a document which provides the backdrop mm -hmm. for the budget to then announce policy initiatives on. You know, the, uh, let me just quote, if you, if you would, what former finance minister P, uh, uh, P. Chidambaram has just said. He says the economic survey repeats ad nauseum that at the end of 21-22, the economy would have recovered to pre-pandemic levels. It means in plain language that on 31-3-2022, the GDP will be back at the same level as it was on 31 3 2020. It means that it has taken two years to go back to where we were. How do you respond? Do you, do you, you know, that's the glass half empty view that we are virtually still where we were two years ago and we are celebrating that. I, I would have, I would have expected Mr. Chidambaram, knowing how an astute, uh, you know, finance person he is, uh, to make a much more reasonable comment on that. Of course, we know that the two years we have lost the growth. But the fact is that we are still, and as I think Subhash Gurk pointed out, will be thankfully 2% higher than what we were at the end of March 20, March 20, the fiscal year 1920, and not at the same level. Of course we have. And, 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 and would, would anybody have uh, done differently in the pandemic years? The best of the global economies have suffered. Uh, the, you know, the, it was an external shock. Of, of, of unforeseen and historical proportions. And the fact is that our recovery in the second half of 2021 has been the smartest. And we will, I mean, it's, I don't like saying this very often, but we will remain the fastest growing large economy in the world going forward. So the fact is that Mr. Chidamram should recognize mm -hmm. the, the nature of shock uh, that, that, that we face. And he would, he would recollect how he responded to the shock of the 2008-2009 global financial crisis by opening up the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, taps for extra spending, which then caused runaway inflation. We don't. This government doesn't want to do that. This doesn't want. This government doesn't want to, uh, you know, uh, let inflation rip. And this government is in the business of so sorting out, addressing supply supply side bottlenecks, improve logistics, improve productivity improve competitiveness so that we can get sustained employment generation as we go forward. But My to say that after two years, we're still at the same level, I think is, is, is not expected of a, of a former finance minister. So let me ask you in conclusion, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, looking ahead to tomorrow's budget, the big challenge, what is that one big thing that you, that you believe is the biggest challenge facing the finance minister tomorrow? <laughs> The biggest challenge, uh, if I, if your permission, may I mention two, is to one to ensure uh, that uh, private investment uh, kicks off and responds, and 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 and, and then rises uh, to the level that it should or it can, and and that's what the big challenge is because that is uh, this government is committed to uh, a private sector-led growth in the economy, and the second one, of course. Uh, is employment, uh, which is that we need to generate employment. The, the higher rate uh, the, the, you can get in the sectors like construction, housing, exports of labor-intensive products, agriculture, the better off we would be, and that's what is required. So those are the two challenges that, in my view, okay. uh, the finance minister will address in the budget tomorrow. Dr. Kumar, as always, pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. 
for giving us uh, your perspective from your vantage point as uh, at uh, Niti Aayog. Thanks very much for joining Thank me you, this you. evening. Let's then reflect upon what the government is saying and what the critics are saying. Shankar Iyer, it appears that the government believes that the worst is over. They are pointing to buoyant exports to a strong fiscal situation as a sign that Indian, the Indian economy is far better placed today than it was certainly a year or uh, a year ago. The critics are saying that there are serious issues still to be addressed, particularly when it comes to jobs, when it comes to uh, private consumption. Where do you stand? Well, certainly the economy is better placed than it was six months back or 12 months back, or even, dare I say, 24 months back. Uh, you would know that the, India's economy moved from slowdown to lockdown, and then to contraction and now to recovery. So this is a long path. Uh, like what Pranab Sen said, my, my worry about the economic survey is what it doesn't mention. Mm. So we don't know in 2021, forget this year, in 2020-21, what was the household savings, what was the gross capital formation. So those, the data of that level. So the big worry for the uh, government should be that gross savings is still low, gross capital formation is still low. Mm -hmm. And there is much talk about how we will boost growth through infrastructure and spending. Uh, so Rajdeep, two thirds of the spending in India GDP is done, uh, rather two thirds of government spending in India is done by the state governments. State governments and governments in general at large are sitting o with over four, four and a half lakh crores, depending on whose estimates you do. So why is the government borrowing at 6.7% and sitting on roughly five lakh crores? I mean, even if I leave out the central government. So the question that the government and the budget needs to under uh, address is why aren't state governments spending the money that they have borrowed or are they are sitting on? Is that the government, state government doesn't have avenues to spend on? There are roughly 45,000 vacancies in the health sector, five lakh vacancies in the, so, uh, in the teaching education sector, the two, one fifth of the posts in police personnel are vacant. Are the state governments saying that there, there is no scope of uh, addressing these issues? You know what has happened to education in the pandemic. So the question that, uh, the data point that I would like to see in the economic survey henceforth is, what is the amount of cash that state governments are spending in? Certainly the central government right. knows that amount and I hope the finance minister uh, highlights this amount. The second point is that why aren't state governments uh, spending the money that has been raised? I mean, they are getting a free pass in this whole system because we are so centralized. Mm -hmm. I think the big challenge for the budget uh, is not to fall or not to fall for the temptation of let's do something. Mm -hmm. If they don't do anything, let the invisible hand in the economy play out. I think we would be far better, in, far, in a far better place next year at this time than we are now. I think this temptation to do something, to create an expenditure tax, to stimulate the bottom of the pyramid, all of these, I hope they are not happening and that tomorrow's budget is a very boring budget so that we are not sort of analyzing that which shouldn't have happened. Interesting. You're saying the more boring the budget is tomorrow, the better it is. Don't tinker around. This is not a time to be t playing tinker woman or tinker man, as it may. Uh, Dr. Sabnavis, your view, looking ahead, seeing what the economic survey has, the government fiscal position seems very good. That gives the government possibly a lot of elbow room to, uh, to stimulate investment even further. What's your sense from the economic survey? In a sense, I get is that when we are saying that the GDP is going to grow by 8 to 8.5%, 8 that is going to be the base on which all the fiscal numbers come about. 
So I think the robustness which we are talking of in uh, GD, expected GDP growth, which I think is fairly reasonable at eight to eight and a half percent, even though we at Bank of Baroda are looking at a number of seven and a half percent. But I go with the view that we have taken some part between the seven and a half and the nine percent. We are actually talking of something like 13, 13 and a half percent growth in uh, nominal GDP, which means that the tax revenue is going to be buoyed. And given the fact that uh, uh, they're going to work on the basis of the resources which are available, we may not be having the luxury of the disinvestment because I, 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 going by the government's reports, they're saying that the 1 lakh crores will materialize, in which case I will not be getting this 1 lakh crores next year. So this actually means that the government will have to fine-tune the expenditure to the revenue. And I think that's why I think that uh, there's going to be a focus on capital expenditure. But we should remember one thing, the Rajdeep, that uh, capital expenditure of the government cannot move the economy. We need to have the private sector also come in because we are talking of capital formation of around 70, 75 lakh crores. Five and a half lakh crores cannot drive 75 lakh crores. States need to spend, the private sector needs to spend. And I think the budget can only provide a kind of incentives. I think one thing which we always get carried away is we think that the budget is a panacea for all our problems. Employment should be taken care of, agriculture should grow, SME should grow, so on and so forth. I think we should look at the policy packages which have been there for the last two years. They have been very reasonable and put, and they have been helping industry, SMEs in different ways. Right. So the actual push which is going to come from here, given the fact that we have to look after the concerns of farmers, we have to look at uh, Nariga. The, food free, the free food which is being given, which have to extend for some point of time. I think we should be a bit uh, moderate in terms of our expectations. The government will do something on CapEx. And I think that is something which should be taken on by the private sector so that we are able to have this virtuous cycle of investment started. You know, uh, Professor Arun Kumar, you're on the other hand, the complete skeptic of this government. You've been, a, you've been very critical of their policies. You've claimed that this whole talk of a V-shaped recovery doesn't take into account the fact that there are several sectors hurting, especially informal sector. Given what you've seen in the survey, do you believe that the finance minister has a lot of elbow room tomorrow to ensure an element of correction in, these un in this uneven growth, particularly reaching out to those who've, hurt, who've been hurt the most by the pandemic? So, you know, Rajdeep, if you look at the CGA report of November, what you find is the expenditures by the government are far lagging compared to what they should have been at this stage of uh, the game. Uh, especially capital expenditures, only 49.4% of the total target for the year. And the fiscal deficit is way down at 46.2% you know, in November end. Now, there are four months left after November and this can't catch up. So, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the demand generation from the budget has been lagging behind in the economy. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think, you know, the organized sector itself has just about reached the Q2 level uh, of uh, 2019. Uh, there also, you know, if you look at the Q2 uh, data that was presented some time back, consumption is lagging, uh, both government and private consumption. Uh, uh, so unless the government begins to increase expenditures, you know, where would the boost come from? because exports by themselves are not going to boost it because we have to look at the gap between the uh, imports and the exports. That is what gives a boost to the economy. Right. So by, uh, by itself, it's not the case. So I don't think the rate of growth of the economy is 9.2%. It's actually much less. Mm -hmm. And I don't think next year it'll grow at 8.4%. Uh, it'll probably be growing at uh, much less than 8.4%. Unless the government begins to increase its expenditure, both capital expenditure and other expenditures, if you look at the budget uh, that was presented for this year, the increase in the total expenditure was barely 1% over the revised estimate. Mm -hmm. So even that is not being achieved uh, as far as uh, the data to November is concerned. So I'm, I'm quite worried, you know, that uh, what the government is doing is mm -hmm. unlikely to give the kind of boost that is required. Because let, for, for as, as people have been Mr. discussing, Gar we need... Let Mr. Garg respond to that. Mr. Garg, do you believe that the government could do much more in terms of uh, uh, expenditure to kickstart the economy, to push the growth, uh, uh, to create jobs, critically to create jobs, to reduce inequalities? I think first, we, uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about two points. One, that the government has a lot of fiscal space which can be used for expenditure. And second, the government has done very well in capital, capital expenditure. I think both of these things are important to answer what the government can do further. 
the fact that Mr. Arun Kumar pointed out that in eight months, we have 2.75 lakh crores of the capital expenditure out of five and a half lakh crore budget, less than 50%. And if you look at the trend in last few months, this is actually declining. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that when this year ends, you would not be able to do five and a half lakh crore of capital expenditure. Right. So <clears throat> placing too much hope on capital expenditure is perhaps misplaced. Then one thing we should also remember that the capex of the government, basically in the transport sector, railways and, uh, and highways, mm -hmm. is largely funded from the excise revenues and what we call CRIF, uh, this uh, Central Road and Infrastructure Fund. Now that has peaked in the year 2021-22 with the global oil prices being very high, the government is under pressure and it's already reduced the, um, the excise duties and taxes on, um, on the diesel and petrol. And going forward, perhaps it will have to do a little more. Mm -hmm. If that is what continues, the resource to fund the capital expenditure for the next year will actually not be available. So I would actually be seeing how the finance minister puts up the capex target for the next year. It will be very challenging because from the normal budget, you can't find resource to fund the capex. Now the, about the fiscal space, it's true, it's good that there has been good uh, sort of recovery on taxes, especially on the corporate um, taxes and the uh, personal income taxes. But again, if you look at the trend in last uh, quarter, the results for which are coming up, the, uh, the corporate revenues are also sort of tapering off. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in 1819, we had the corporate taxes of 6.7 lakh crores. This year, our budget target is only 5.7 lakh crores. We are even three years before corporate tax right. recording. Right. And we are borrowing 15 lakh crores for uh, uh, for spending. Now, any fiscal space created by so much of borrowing in a situation where the inflation is high and the global demand, which came in the form of the exports, is now tapering off. So this year, the the in 21, the the global exports grew by 10 percent. Next year, they are expected to grow only by four to five percent. And therefore, your export growth will not actually be happening next year as much as we do. So I see enormous challenges. Then we have also domestic challenges. For example, food subsidy is threatening to now go to four lakh crores. I see a lot of fiscal constraint in the hands of government to sort of spend its way to Let prosperity or growth. Let me take that to Dr. Sen, because, you know, the, the government in the economic survey on the positive side is pointing to the buoyancy in tax collections. They're pointing to the buoyancy in exports, uh, you know, seemingly suggesting that the second wave last year had a much milder effect on the economy than the first. So with a fiscal situation under control, exports up, is that the big positive that you would take away? Does the government have reason to believe that we can create export-led growth or are there limits as uh, Mr. Garg there suggested? Uh, Raj, the, the big positives are first is that the fiscal numbers look very good. I mean, I don't think the finance ministry even expected these, these kinds of, of numbers. Uh, so that's, that's a big, big plus. Uh, the second, of course, as they have flagged, our exports have done very well. And... Uh, Hopefully, if the global economy recovers rapidly from the Omicron effect, uh, exports will continue to do well. Uh, whether they'll touch $400 uh, billion, I don't know. But, but exports are doing well and should continue to do well. The point really is that you have to, in a, something like the economic survey, you have to ask what the causes of this are. Uh, is it that Indian exports are doing well because Indian exporters are not finding a domestic market because consumption is too weak. In which case, the implication would be that as 
the Indian economy starts moving, uh, exports may, may actually slow down quite dramatically. These are the kinds of issues that the economic survey should be talking about. Or for that matter, if you're looking at the fiscal numbers, there's been a massive increase in, in tax receipts. Is that because there's been huge growth in the economy and everybody is richer? Or is it because that those who pay taxes are richer and those who don't pay taxes are not? What And the kind of actions you take would really depend upon what your diagnosis is. In, in a sense, uh, Dr. Sen, you're pointing out to the real concern, which is growing inequalities. As I said earlier, 84% of household incomes have declined in these uh, pandemic years. Do you believe that's the major challenge going ahead for the finance minister, finding where finding ways in which we can reduce inequalities at the moment in the times in which we are? You're absolutely right, Rajni. That is my primary concern. And that, frankly, should be everybody's concern. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the budget is about the welfare of our people. Mm -hmm. Now, what should be done is is really a, a more difficult question. Um, there, there, you know, economists can and will disagree. But at least let's get the diagnosis on the same mm -hmm. page. Now, if these kinds of inequality numbers that are coming up, and mind you, the surveys that, that have been projecting this, the price survey and so on, uh, I am not sure about the, the quality, but there is just too much uh, of uh, evidence that's coming out which suggests that significantly. Mm -hmm. Now, for the government to address the problem of inequality is not easy. And it is certainly not a short-term uh, gain. Inequality can only be addressed very gradually over an extended period of time. But a game plan has to be laid out. I'm not, not even sure that that particular mode of thought exists in the finance ministry at the moment. That's a very serious comment you're making, that there isn't clarity on how are you going to reduce inequality. Shankar Ayer, you agree with that, that that is the big challenge of our times? It's the challenge globally, but it certainly is a challenge in a country like India at the moment. Absolutely. I think there was there is a lesson why the 11th letter of the alphabet K has been used to describe how the economy is recovering. So, I mean, the V-shaped recovery is a no-brainer because if you dive deep into the pool, you are going to come up straight up. So that's not the question. The question is how the economy is recovering post the pandemic. And there is absolutely no doubt that there has been a clear uh, bipolar recovery of the economy. Uh, I reserve, uh, you know, the right to uh, prevent the government from addressing or the budget from addressing uh, what are demand side issues? I think uh, governments over the past 70 years have been very poor at addressing the issue of inequality. I think what needs to be addressed is to what is the central cause of inequality is the asymmetry in opportunity and skills. Mm -hmm. So that is what the government should have, uh, address. If two years your school children in government schools do not have teachers or classes, you're going to have a big problem ahead. If over six lakh villages have one lakh primary health centers or community care centers, you are going to have a problem ahead. If your average years in school is going to be five years or three years uh, in parts of India, you are going to have a problem. If your average per capita income is Bihar is half of that of UP and UP is that half of that of all India, you are going to have an inequality problem. The okay. issue is that how the government should address all the friction points in the economy. Just liberate the friction points, enable people to do their thing. And private people, private economy is smarter than public right. uh, policy. So they will work around that. I think that the, the inequality issue is very, very serious and you can figure this out from the language of the campaign in the five pole bound states as they uh, the number of visits that it is taking ruling party or other parties to deal with it right and the central theme in india's economy is if nearly half the population is dependent on one sixth of the economy which is the agriculture sector 
you have a long term problem that you need to address which means you move people from farms to urban economy and, and that that intersection you will have to work a little harder the demand on narega shows the distress in the economy uh, the number of jobs lost it shows so the government if it just reduces the friction points makes more credit available to micro uh, and small enterprises good allows people to run home bound businesses good allows professionals to do services from home good and bring down the burden of gst on the service sector which is where the growth can come right. you can't have 18% uh, service tax on people and then go around saying that we are a startup economy we are going to do services bound economy there's something contradictory about the high level of uh gst imposed on self employed professionals or businesses Th these things are the things that the budget needs to address i do hope there are no new welfare schemes because the government is very bad very has a very poor track record at addressing the demand side issues i do hope the finance minister finds a minute to tell the state that they have not been doing their job okay let me uh, uh, quickly get in uh, uh, dr fadnavis uh, sabnavis for a last word dr sabnavis you are you've just heard uh, uh, shankar ayer saying the government itself needs to stay out of these large welfare schemes instead allow in a way individuals professionals the private sector to find its own ways by interfering less by tinkering less you agree No, actually, I have a different view, uh, Rajdi. First, on the issue of inequality, I think expecting the budget to address the issue of inequality, I think, is quite ridiculous. I agree, uh, inequality is a major problem for us. You address it by creating more jobs. Uh, a budget is an income and expenditure statement of the government of India or of the state governments. Now, expecting that to take care of an equality problem, to my mind, is not is not being fair. I don't think governments can do that. No, you create it, jobs. It's not about the budget, but it's about recognizing state. it. It's at least the recognition. Today's economic survey the also doesn't there, seem Rajdeep, to recognize the nature have, of the problem. See, see, uh, Rajdeep, the thing is that we have something called a PM Kisan. We have subsidies. We have a good number of economists who keep saying you should not be giving subsidies. Now, where does the government end? You have a Nariga program. You have the free cash which is being given, free food being given. So, I think the government is being fairly, uh, fairly, fairly progressive when it comes to trying to help out the poor. But inequality cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, what you call gotten rid of. In, in 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 a budget, we have the states who have to work. Now we spoke of education and health. There are also issues. There are also concurrent subjects. So the state governments also need to spend on it. If mm -hmm. the states are not doing, we cannot expect the the centre to do it. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to be a bit rational when we are talking of the budget. It's an income expenditure statement. If I earn X amount of rupees, I can spend only X amount of rupees. So maybe why and there's a certain amount of borrowing. It has repercussions everywhere. So I just say that we need to moderate our expectations from the budget okay. and our demands from the expectation, and let's not just criticize for the sake of criticizing. Because the moment are on a high fiscal deficit, I mean the same six of us are going to come here and say that look, we are ruining the economy. It's going to lead to hyperinflation, Venezuela, Zimbabwe. I think so. I think let's uh, let's uh, strike a balance. Sir. I just have thirty seconds, Professor Arun Kumar. Very quickly, your final you know, prescription. Yeah, so you know, I think we what we are doing is we are mixing up the long term with the short term. Nobody is saying that inequality can be uh, eliminated immediately, but just let's take the example of education. Large number of people who have lost incomes, they have pulled their children out of schools, they have pulled their children out of private schools and sent to government schools. So unless government spe uh, steps in and spends a lot more on education and better education, as Shankar rightly pointed out, the education quality is abysmal. Similarly, the health quality is abysmal. Uh, do we expect the private sector to set up uh, clinics and hospitals in the rural areas, etc.? So government definitely has a role. It's not simply a, that the budget is an accounting thing. Budget fuels policies. You know, policies that have been existing. If it fuels one, then as compared to the other, then the priorities change. So budgets do change priorities. Budgets do uh, mean that policies are, uh, can be better implemented. Policies which are different, which have not been implemented, they can be brought on the anvil. Right. So government has a role. and government must play a role because given the inequality and the poverty increasing in the country as the data seems to suggest i think if the government doesn't play that role we have a social explosion coming on that sobering note uh i just want to thank each and every one of you we'll have much many more of your thoughts tomorrow on budget day we'll have a stellar panel of many more guests joining us 
It starts 7 a.m. onwards here on India Today, where we also bring in the Business Today team, uh, experts who've been tracking budgets for decades, giving you their experience and their insights. So look forward to that. All eyes on Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman as she delivers her 2022 budget. We'll see whether this budget can offer a kickstart to the economy that it so desperately needs or whether it simply remains a case of managing or managing the crisis that we faced over the last 24 months. Thanks for watching. Stay well, stay safe. Good night. Shubhratri.